Amen? Amen. Daniel 12. Some of it's on the screen, not all. Let's read it. And at that time, I'm reading out of the old King James. You know why? Because I'm old. Okay. At that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people, and there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, even to that same time. And at that time, thy people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book. And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, amen, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament. They that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book even to the time of the end. Many, the time of the end, many shall run to and fro and knowledge shall be increased. Then I, Daniel, looked, and behold, there stood other two, the one on this side of the bank of the river and the other on that side of the bank of the river. And one said to the man, clothed in linen, which was upon the waters of the river, how long shall it be to the end of these wonders? And I heard the man clothed in linen, which was upon the waters of the river, when he held up his right hand and his left hand unto heaven and swear by him that liveth forever that it shall be for a time, times, and a half. And when he shall have accomplished to scatter the power of the holy people, all these things shall be finished. And I heard, but I understood not. Then said I, O oh my Lord, what shall the end of these things? He said, Go thy way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. We believe the book of the Revelation is the unraveling of that closed message. Many shall be purified and made white and tried. But the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. And from the time that the daily sacrifice shall be taken away, and the abomination that maketh desolate set up, there shall be a thousand two hundred and ninety days. Hmm. Blessed is he that waiteth and cometh to the thousand three hundred and five and thirty days. But go thou thy way till the end be, for thou shalt rest and stand in thy lot at the end of the days. Wow, what a chapter. It's not easy to understand this chapter. Daniel didn't even know who he's talking about. And a lot of people read it and they don't know what it's talking about either. That's like reading the book of Revelation. But did you know it's the one book in the New Testament that all Orthodox rabbis invite their people to read? The book of Revelation. Why is that? Because it quotes voluminously, not only from Daniel, but from all the Old Testament prophets. In fact, computer studies at the university in Jerusalem, Hebrew universities, have shown that the majority of the book of Revelation is simply a quotation from the Old Testament. Now, I myself years ago found 400 quotes in that book. But the computers now have found 721. It is amazing, the book of Revelation. It's like the whole Bible was dumped in one book and expects us to know what it is all about. Amen? That's why you need to buy my book. It will help you understand. Okay, let's talk to the Lord for a moment. Father, you know everybody who's here. 
You know those that love coming but are not really sure that if they died today, they'd be in heaven with the Lord, even though you said, absent from the body, present with the Lord. Remember our Lord Yeshua told the chief rabbi of Israel, a man named Nicodemus, he said, except a man be born again, he will never see the kingdom of heaven. Lord, I pray that the seriousness of that remark might hit the audience tonight like never before, that we might realize we will never be in heaven if we have never been born again of the Spirit of God. Lord, may that happen to many this night, we pray. In the blessed name that is above every name, the name of our Lord, Yehoshua, Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ our Lord, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Well, let's start way Daniel 12 starts, with the rescue of the people of God. The rescue of the people of God. I don't like to talk about this from one personal a, a point of view. I love Israel. All of you who know me know that. Uh, I was there listening to a Philco radio in our home to hear my unbelieving father tell us all to be quiet that the prime minister of Israel, the first one, David Ben-Gurion, was going to tell us all what the name of that land would be. I heard it with my own ears. It was on the voice of Israel in Hebrew and on the voice of America in English. And all I can tell you is my dad, once he heard it was Eretz Israel, which is what Ezekiel predicts will be the name of it. Eretz means land in Hebrew. That's the official name. Don't worry that they only call it Israel and they don't say the whole name because they're trying to take the land away from them. No, that land was given to them by God. You get this book, Israel Celebrating 70 Years, and you will never again let anybody tell you that that land doesn't belong to Israel. It belongs to Israel from the Euphrates River all the way to the Nile. Saudi Arabia, you belong to Israel. Yemen, Bahrain, Lebanon, Jordan, Syria, you all belong to Israel. And one day the Messiah himself will give it to you. He's already promised it. Now, as I looked at this uh, final message, I realized there's trouble coming. And that's why I don't want to tell my Jewish friends, but I do. I speak in a number of synagogues also. Not Messianic, although I speak in those also. But in regular Jewish synagogues. I have spoken in the largest one in North America. They have 12,000 people. They opened that big audience of 12,000 with me to ans ask me questions. And I turned to the rabbi, the head of it. His name was Feinstein. And I asked him if he had a relative in the <laughs> Senate. And he got really mad because he doesn't, he doesn't support her. But anyway... I said, what am I going to do if they bring up about the Messiah? He says, you're going to answer all questions. That's what you promised. Okay. He said, maybe they won't ask. And he started laughing. <laughs> I said, I think your laughter means that somebody's going to laugh. The first man stood up and he said, what about Yeshua being the Messiah of Israel? I turned to the rabbi and he already left the stage. Well, there I was with 12,000 people. But what an opportunity to speak of our blessed Lord. Trouble is coming. It's already started. By the way, Israel never killed anybody. That was a lie on MSNBC, which is primarily fake news. But you need to watch very carefully the news agencies right now, they're very anti-Israel. Israel made a direct hit on a missile lab just a little bit north of the Israeli border. 
owned by Iran. Now Iran and its leader Rouhani has threatened Israel with extermination and annihilation. And he has threatened President Trump as well. Iran, Turkey, and Russia, two weeks ago, signed a permanent alliance whose sole purpose is to get rid of Trump of the United States and Israel once and for all. Sounds to me like Ezekiel 38 and 39 is warming up. I don't know if you're ready to meet the Lord. I would not be surprised one bit if he came tonight before we get done. We'll be out about two. <laughs> Let me tell you the following things about the rescue of God's people. There is some good news. Number one, look at, please, the defense that... Michael the archangel is going to bring. Wow. God bless Michael the archangel. There's only one archangel. Shirley MacLaine is wrong. She said there's seven. No, there's not. There's only one. His name is Michael, which means who is like God in Hebrew. And his special job is taking care of the nation of Israel. Isn't that amazing? And the archangel has done a lot of remarkable things. He's killed thousands of people just by a, the swing of his sword. Wow. But the second thing is that the distress is coming for Israel. Look at the words that are in our text. There shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation. Wow. Now, that's primarily the time of Jacob's trouble, as Jeremiah chapter 30 puts it. I wish it didn't happen. And I tell my Orthodox Jewish friends when I speak in their synagogues, I wish it didn't happen, but it's in the Bible. It's in the Jewish Bible, and there's a lot of stuff about it. So the important thing would be to make sure you're ready for it. Here's a third thing, the deliverance of God's people. At that time, my Bible says, your Bible says, if you have Daniel 12, that the people of God are going to be delivered. Everyone that's found written in the book. Listen, if you're not born again, you'll never be in the book of life. There's an old song that says, is my name written there on the pages bright and fair? I hope you know the Lord. A couple of more things about that rescue. One, he mentions the destiny of all those that awake. He's talking about everybody who will be resurrected. Oh, good news, people say. There's going to be everybody resurrected. Um, no, not quite. Some to everlasting life to be with our Lord forever in the kingdom of the Messiah. But some, unfortunately, to shame and everlasting contempt who continue in their wickedness, their ignoring of the Lord, acting like the preachers are crazy. Listen, they mock the messengers of God according to the book of Jeremiah and that happened until there was no more remedy and Babylon came and destroyed Jerusalem. All the homes of Jerusalem were burned and destroyed. The temple of Solomon was destroyed. It's a tragedy that is still in the minds and hearts of Jewish people even today. Wow. But the dedication is going to be rewarded. Look at this. Those who lead many to righteousness will shine like the stars forever and ever. Yes, there's going to be a great reward for God's people who understand that these times have been prophesied in the Bible and they are going to happen. Uh, let me just give one that's related to what's happening now. Uh, we know in Isaiah 17, 1, 
that Damascus is going to be a heap of ruins. That's what the Bible says. I don't know if you've gone on the internet yet, but I recommend it. You can go on and look at all the pictures of Damascus right now. You will not believe it. I've been in Damascus. It was quite a city. I've been in that street they call Straight that is like a giant uh, tunnel with the shops on every side and it bustles with excitement and all of that. I've been there, but it's no longer there. Damascus is now a heap of ruins. How much does it have to keep going on until we realize God's word is being fulfilled right now as I'm giving this message? And Russia isn't helping. Russia is supporting Bashar Assad, the pharmacist who became the leader of Syria. I knew his dad, Afaz Assad, one of the most wicked, terrible men I have ever met in my entire life. And this is his son. His son has ordered the death of over 500,000 Syrians already. His own people he killed. We have also Hezbollah and Hamas and, of course, Al-Qaeda. And we have, as you well know, ISIS. And they're all involved in it. They're destroying that place. But don't worry about it. The Messiah is going to rebuild it. And it's going to belong to Israel. Wow. Let's go to a second matter. After talking about the rescue of the people of Israel, the revelation of these events, it's, it's to be sealed. Verse 4 says, seal the book that be Daniel, even to the time of the end, which is a book of Revelation. In Amos chapter 8, we have a little statement about the events that will occur. The events. They're going to run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. And in the commentaries on Daniel, and I have one on Daniel, there's a number of interpretations of this. I always prefer to have the Bible interpret the Bible. You see, I'm so crazy, I believe the Bible is the only one telling the truth. So that's why I continue to preach the Bible, the whole Bible, and nothing but the Bible. I'm so crazy, I'm currently teaching on Monday nights the book of Chronicles. Why did I teach that? Because I looked up on the web, I couldn't find any preacher who taught Chronicles. So I said, I think I will. Now that I'm almost at the end of it, after a year and a half, it seems to me that I might have made a mistake. <laughs> but no, I didn't. All the kings of Israel were evil. Half of the ones of Judah were evil. And everything God said he's going to do, he did it already. So don't tell me we aren't going to experience God's judgment upon this planet. It's coming, folks. It's coming. So what about this phrase, many shall run to and fro? They say, oh, that's just the cars are speeding faster. I don't think so. Here's Amos 8. Listen to these words. Just listen to them. Verse 11 and 12. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord God, that I'll send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. They shall wander from sea to sea, from the north to the east. They shall run, here it is, to and fro to seek the word of the Lord and shall not find it. I was going to do this, and I know, then I thought, well, don't do it to these poor people out there in San Jacinto. They need a happy day. But I was going to read you all the letters that people have sent to me, even in these last few months, about the failure to find churches that really teach the Bible. 
I got stacks of them. What Amos said was going to happen before the Lord returns has now happened. We are told by a religious survey polling system that 90% of all the churches in North America do not systematically teach through the books of the Bible. They refer to it sometimes, some do. Some don't even do that. Most all the preaching is on human need and how to get along so your wife doesn't kill you before you get home. Do you understand? We have forsaken what God had to say. That's a problem. A very serious problem. So when he said many will go to and fro, what's he talking about? They won't be able to find the information that Daniel was being given right now and that will be in the time of the end, namely the book of Revelation. Wow. Here's a second little issue you probably were thinking about when we read it. The explanation of the man clothed in linen. I love that. Oh, the angels are involved, of course, here, but that man clothed in linen. Woo-wee. In verse 6, they asked about the timing of these events. What is the timing of these events? And that's an interesting question. Verse 6, how long shall it be to the end of these wonders? Do you know in the book of Revelation, chapter 6, it talks about martyrs that are under the altar who have already died and are now with the Lord? Well, interestingly, they aren't in soul sleep or something else that people believe. No, they're talking to one another. By the way, they're dressed. They have a robe. I don't believe you put a robe on gas. I think you put it on a body. I believe we're going to have a body. I've asked for a shorter one than I have now. I'm tired of hitting my head on so many walls. But the fact is, they ask the same question. How long, O Lord, till you avenge our blood on the earth? In other words, the issue of prophecy, even after they died, is still on their hearts. When is this all going to happen? They're asking the question more than we do here. Wow. I notice in verse 7, his acknowledgement of the Father, this one who's clothed in linen. What a beautiful thing. The explanation of that man and his acknowledgement of the Father. It says he, he swore by him that liveth forever and ever. He gave him a specific answer. What was it? It's right there in verse 7. He said, a time, times, plural, and a half. Now, if you're looking at this from a Jewish-Hebrew idiom point of view, it's three and a half years or 1,260 days or 42 months. If you go to the book of Revelation, chapter 11, you'll see that it divides the tribulation period, this time of Jacob's trouble that is worse than they've ever experienced in their history. It's still coming, and it's divided into two parts. The second part is called the great trouble, the great tribulation, because of all that's going to take place. By the middle of that period of time of seven years, By the middle, over one half of the world's population will be killed by the disasters that God is going to bring. Unbelievable. Not only the timing of these events, but the tribulation that is coming. He comments about it. It says, when he shall accomplish to scatter the power of the holy people... All these things shall be finished. Now listen to me. First, the rebirth of the nation of Israel is prophesied in Isaiah chapter 66, and it would happen in one day. And that's exactly what happened on May 14, 1948. And it's been 70 years. And Israel's being blessed. Boy, are they being blessed. The United Nations says the number one nation economically in the world is Israel. 
Did you know that out of all those nations in the United Nations that keep criticizing Israel, 122 of them are now doing business with Israel? Did you also know that the currency that's number one in the world right now is the Israeli shekel? Better than the dollar, the Japanese yen, and so forth. Does the Bible teach that God is going to bless Israel near the end? Yes, it does. As a matter of fact, their desire for wealth and prosperity, which is enormous in that land, their desire is going to shoot them in the foot. And God will show them that the only real answer is the coming of the Messiah. So you see what he said was, when he scatters the power of the people. That's going to happen in the tribulation. I don't want it to happen, but that's what's going to happen. Did you know that Israel is going to be t attacked by all nations on the earth? Every nation will be involved. That includes the United States. And as long as I have breath, I'll keep preaching that it doesn't. I'm sorry to report to you there have been 600 resolutions against Israel in the, in the UN. I'm sorry to report to you that the Islamic world has said the only way we can survive is by the annihilation of the nation of Israel. They hate the Jews. Well, our Lord Yeshua said they'd be hated of all nations for my name's sake. Uh-oh. And the trouble Daniel had, verse 8, he, he heard, but he didn't understand. And he was told in verse 9 that the truth that these words contain. He said the words are closed up and sealed until the time of the end. So it won't be till the book of Revelation is written that he will really understand. Finally, I want to deal in the last four verses with the most exciting things imaginable, the results that are going to happen quickly. Are you ready for them? Number one, the purifying of the righteous. Whoa. Are there going to be Jews saved before the tribulation? Yes. You say, how do you know? Because I'm one. Amen? Yes. I'm going to go in the rapture. It's so whether Jew or Gentile, all are one in Christ. Amen? And we're going to go. Well, that leaves some Jews. Are there Jews that are interested in prophecy and in time? Oh, yes, there are. They speak about it all the time now in the synagogues of the world. Well, guess what? <laughs> God's going to send two guys that have shown up all the time. One is named Moshe, or Moses, and the other one is named Eliyahu, Elijah. Moses and Elijah keep showing up all the time. They were on the Mount of Transfiguration when Peter, James, and John had the opportunity to see the Lord in all of his glory radiating on that mountain. And here's Moses and Elijah and Peter, bless his heart. He puts his foot in his mouth, but at least he said something. Wow, this is fantastic. Let's build a, a tent for every one of these. And all of a sudden a voice came out of heaven, the Father himself. This is my beloved son. Listen to him. Wow. When they finally recovered themselves and looked up, it says they saw no man but Yeshua only. Wow. Did you know they all spoke about it? John said, we beheld his glory. Peter said, we were with him on the mount. We were eyewitnesses of his majesty. He's coming again. Wow. Zechariah 13 says, two parts of Israel are going to be cut off and die. But the third part will be left, 
and I'll bring them through the fire, refine them as silver is refined, try them as gold is tried. They'll call on my name, and I'll hear them, and I'll say, it is my people. Did you know he said that about Israel when they were disobedient and wicked? I'm so glad of that. He said, I'll remember your sins no more. Wow. And they had plenty. The second thing that I bring as a result is the purging of the rebels. Oh, yes, some of them are not going to repent. And they're going to fight the king of kings and lord of lords. They're in the palm and hand of the Antichrist. And they refuse to repent. I'm just finishing a message. I almost brought it to teach tonight, but I wasn't quite done. The name of it, Whatever Happened to Repentance? I'm tracing it through the entire Bible. I'm just about done. People are not repenting. Oh, they get, they get sorrowful for what they've done that, you know, may, to, may have had some consequences. But the sorrow of the world, the Bible says, works death. It doesn't work life. Repentance is a change of mind that leads to a change of conduct. Wow. These rebels are going to be purged by God. The wicked are going to suffer the fires of hell, whether they know it or not. You will not escape that judgment of God. I don't care who you are. There will be no last-minute opportunity. You must do it now while you still have life. The third thing I mention about the results is a blessing. The persecution will be limited. Amen? Thank the Lord for it. It will be 1,290 days. And in that, we have a couple of things mentioned. One the removal of the daily sacrifice. Yes, there's going to be a temple. Yes, they have all the plans and needs. Yes, they have all the vessels. Yes, they have the ark. Yes, they have it all. The Temple Institute will tell you about it. It's in Jerusalem. The leader is Chaim Richmond, a friend of mine, but he's wrong. He's wrong about one thing. He said they are going to build it and receive the Messiah. And I said, no, you're not. If you build it, you're going to receive the Antichrist. No, the one who's going to build that wonderful millennial temple is the Messiah himself. That's found in Zechariah chapter 6, verse 12 and 13. Not only the removal of the sacrifice will happen by this world leader called the Antichrist. He's actually a counterfeit Christ. The world will believe he's great. But we have mentioned here the reign of the Antichrist. If you look very carefully in verse 11, he spoke of the abomination, the abomination of desolation. And in Matthew 24, it refers back to Daniel chapter 12. And that is going to be a terrible day. But it's a wonderful day for the righteous because we're going to be with the Lord forever. Amen? So, verse 12 and 13, I call the promise to the believer. This is what I want to end on. The promise to the believer. First of all, we have a needed response here. He says, verse 12, Blessed is he that waiteth and cometh, to the 1,305 and 30 days. Wait a minute. There's an extra 75 days here. How do we explain it? Well, maybe another speaker can give it to you. I wouldn't do that to you. Why do we have an extra 75 days that we're supposed to wait with great anticipation? Why? Well, let me tell you some reasons. From Isaiah's writings, they're going to set up 
the return of the Messiah and his millennial kingdom. I don't know how long it will take, but it's going to take some time. And there's something else that he tells us about the future. And that is that the righteous are going to be rewarded. Amen? The Bible says when the Lord comes, his reward is with him. It is true. One day when we see him, we'll cast our crowns at his feet. But make no mistake, he wants to reward us. He wants to reward you now. In Hebrews 6.10, he will never forget what you have done in ministering to the righteous. You cared for somebody. He'll never forget. Oh, you talk about things that need to be done in the 75 days? How about the resurrection of Old Testament saints and the martyrs of the tribulation? They will be resurrected at the end. By the way, that's why the marriage supper of the Lamb is not in heaven during the tribulation. Bad theology by the church. No, it has to be on earth to begin the millennial kingdom as every marriage knows that's Jewish. It'll have to be on earth, the home of the bride. And Matthew said, we'll sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Well, they're not resurrected till the end of the tribulation. So you see, the marriage supper of the Lamb will be the thing that introduces the millennial kingdom to the entire world. That's going to take some time, I think. That resurrection will take place. And I looked at all of this and I thought, wow. That's pretty powerful. Those are some results to wait for. But there's one more I don't want to leave out. According to the Bible, what he's going to do at the end of the tribulation during those 75 days, he's going to judge the nation of Israel and all the nations of the world. The whole thing is described in detail in Matthew 25. And it uses the words of sheep on the right hand and goats on the left. The sheep on the right hand, he says, come, blessed of the Father, into the joy of thy kingdom. To those on the left, depart from me into everlasting fire and torment. Wow. Wow. I looked at this whole thing and I thought, what should be our concern? Just look at that. I think the concern is, are you born again? Have you got it up there? Put it up on the slide. We already had that one. Keep going. There it is. Underneath there, I wrote this. It does not matter what church you belong to. If you're not born again, you are not saved, no matter what you say. Look, folks, I get letters all over, not only North America, but the world. We're in many countries also. I'm telling you, people do not have a clear understanding of this at all. They think if they attend a church for a while that it somehow scores points with God, I guess. That isn't going to do it. Well, it, it's my dad. I have a grandfather who is a preacher and my dad is a deacon. And No, that's not going to do it either. It's not your family relationships. Our Lord Yeshua talked to the number one rabbi, the chief rabbi, of Israel at the time. His name was Nicodemus. He came to him at night. He didn't want anybody to know he came. And our Lord knew exactly what he needed. He said, except a man be born again, he will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Well, how can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb? And Yeshua said to him, are you the teacher, the teacher in Israel? And yet you don't know the answer to this. You see, eternal life or everlasting life, living forever with God in that beautiful paradise we call heaven. We're actually coming back to earth to rule and reign. 
But that wonderful hope and reward is only for those who are born again. What will happen if you're not born again? You will be lost forever in a place that calls hell. That's why I'm telling you about it. I don't want you to go to hell. I want you to go to heaven. I want to see you there one day and say, you remember back there on April 22nd? Listen. <laughs> Put the last slide up there. There it is. You must be born again or it will never happen. Will you join me, please, in a closing prayer? Father, you know all of our hearts, and there's not one of us here who can escape your knowledge or act like we don't know. We know that you know. And sometimes, Lord, in the quietness of our own hearts, we're not really sure that we've ever been spiritually born of God, that your spirit has taken over and brought us to yourself. Lord, I pray for these precious people here that those who are not sure might right now say, I want to settle this. I want to make my commitment to the Lord who died for me and rose again and is coming back to take me home. With your heads bowed and eyes closed, don't look around. Just maintain privacy for everybody. If you want to settle this relationship with the Lord, right where you are, though no one knows what you're doing, just raise your hand up to the Lord and say, that's me. Yes. Just right where you is. Right where you are. Yes. Yes. Way in the back. Yes. And down here, yes, and over here in the aisle, and you, yes, sir. And way back there on my right at the back of the auditorium, and over here on the side. You say, I, I need to settle this. I, I need it so bad. I need to clear the fog, clear the mind. I need to know that I am spiritually alive and ready to meet the Lord when he comes. Yes, God bless you. Yes, ma'am. God loves you. He died for your sins. There's no way you'll ever pay for them. He paid for them. And he's not a dead savior. He arose from the dead. It was seen of many, many people for 40 days after his resurrection. And he is coming back. Is he coming for you? Father, you see the hearts, not just the hands. You know when every hand was raised what's going on inside of them. And Lord, I pray by your powerful Holy Spirit, you would draw them now to your word and to find out exactly what we are to do. And I thank you, Lord, for them. In the blessed name of our Lord Yeshua, we pray. Amen. Just before we conclude, just a week ago when I was in Reading, I spoke at a place called the Little Country Church. I was there when they just started with 40 people. They now have over 2,000. And while we were singing, people were coming forward. And I turned to some of the, just like these folks, worshipers, and I said, uh, what, what's this all about? I didn't know what it was about. They said, we have no idea. So the pastor got some people down to get, they all wanted to get saved. And he asked the first man, he said, well, you know, we usually give an invitation at the end of the service. He said, sir, I don't know who you are, but you, you can't wait if you're like me. I need to know now. And they got on their knees and turned to the Lord. Listen, tell somebody about it. Tell somebody about it. Ask for help. Don't be ashamed. We're all in this together. We all come the same way. We are sinners saved by grace. We don't deserve it. We never have. He alone is worthy. Amen.